After a 300 million mile journey through space, the Mars Perseverance rover is ready to begin the most challenging part of the trip, landing on the red planet. If successful, it will embark on the most advanced mission ever sent here to discover if life ever existed on Mars. The Rocket Ranch welcomes Dr. Mujige Cooper, NASA JPL's planetary protection lead for Mars Perseverance. She'll tell us how she and her team are actually protecting Mars, and she'll describe the incredibly complex maneuvers needed to land on the red planet. Plus, she'll tell us about the most exciting parts of its astrobiology mission. I'm Daryl Nail, and this is the Rocket Ranch. CGS Program Chief Engineer, verify no constraints to launch. Three, two, one, and lift off. Welcome to space. It is an exciting time. We are not too far away from the landing of the Perseverance rover on the surface of Mars. This was a project you were involved in pretty closely. Definitely, yeah. You know every part of that rover. Every, every square centimeter. <laughs> and, and why is that? Uh, so every single part, almost every single part of the rover that's landing right now and the whole system that's landing it has been sampled by myself or my team. To make sure that it had no excessive amount of it, microbes, right? exactly. So we had to make sure that it was clean enough so it doesn't contaminate the surface of Mars, where we're trying to explore for possible ancient life. So this is a it's a high tech robotic geologist, right? Yeah. Going to the surface and doing the work of a geologist remotely. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's going to go there and do so many exciting things, both for future human missions, you know, creating oxygen for fuel or for breathing air looking at the weather system so that we can make sure we prepare accordingly, bring the right sunscreen, right? <laughs> yes. Um, all kinds of things, great tech demos, it's really exciting. So before we get to the surface, there's this exciting part where the Perseverance rover has to land. Yes. <laughs> it's a big deal. It is. So much so they call it the, the seven minutes of terror. Now, why is that? Yeah, because it's a terrifying seven minute process that where many things have to go right. You have a parachute that has to be deployed at the right time. You have, a, you have to have a separation of the back shell and the heat shield in a way so that the, the heat shield doesn't slam back into the launch vehicle or into the, the descent stage. You have to make sure all those components are gone. The descent stage needs to fire at just the right time so that the whole system doesn't slam onto the surface of Mars. It has to descend on an umbilical. Those umbilicals need to be cut at the right time. It needs to fly away so that it doesn't drag the rover. I mean, all of these things have to happen right. It's such a fascinating engineering uh, feat that you guys are, are pulling off there. It's just amazing, even watching the animations. It's just like, wow. Yeah, it's amazing. The, the EDL team, Entry, Descent, and Landing team, has done such a phenomenal job in planning and preparing for this. Uh, it's it's really exciting. It should be seven minutes of excitement. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you would rename that's, it. That's for everybody else except for the EDL team. <laughs> <laughs> Great point. And speaking of excitement, everybody, most people are familiar if, if you follow um, the exploration programs out of JPL with that shot of the control room, the mission control room where everybody is there. Now, this is a podcast, so we kind of paint word pictures, but y you've got everybody there. They're sitting behind their monitors and their workstations. And there is that moment where they confirm that it's gone through the atmosphere, it's done everything that you just described, yeah. and landed softly and gently on the surface of Mars, and now it can do its work. Yep. Why is there this, why do they, you see people jumping for joy and hugging each other and crying? Yeah, I mean, with all of those things that could, that have to be right, right, that, that means there are so many things that could go wrong. Right? And, and with that successful signal acquisition that yes, we indeed landed, I mean, that just sparks such a, a, a sense of joy because now you know you can move on to the next phase to, to start surface operations. So you'll get the, the Adam Stelzner jumping for joy in the, in the room, which will be Al Chen this time around. He's going to be jumping for joy in his whatever color shirt they <laughs> print out for this crew <laughs> and the whole team. Um, so yeah, it's just exciting because now you have cemented that, that phase in, into stone, right? That now you can move on to the next 
Big now thing. the science begins. Yeah. The, the, the scary part of getting off the earth, traveling you know, 300 million miles and landing on the surface is over. Yeah. Now the science can begin. Um, you know, one of the things I think of when, when they do the EDL, when, when it lands, is that I, I think, it was, I don't know if it was during Curiosity or, or one of the recent missions where I, I believe there was a choreographed uh, dance move. Oh, that was for Insight, yeah. Was, oh, the Insight <laughs> lander, yes. right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, any, any knowledge of any, uh, any plans for any you celebratory know, dances? I, I don't know uh, of any plans, <laughs> but I know the, right, the person that would do something. <laughs> I'm ah. gonna ask this person. Yeah, are you gonna out that person? Uh, I won't out this person, but I might ask him to do something or give me a little bit of knowledge. I'll sneak you in a word later. <laughs> I appreciate that, yeah. You have to watch, basically, right? Watch the landing show. Uh, that'll be an exciting one to watch. What will you be doing for the landing of the rope? Yeah, I will be, at the minimum, watching online from the comfort of my home. I hope to find some sort of party, of course, a COVID-safe party. <laughs> but I will find some party to, to watch, hopefully with colleagues at a socially distant uh, distance. <laughs> right, right, because, I mean, that, that's part of it, right? It, it, it's celebrating with those that you have, uh, you know, put so much blood, sweat, and tears with exactly. when a project comes to fruition like that. Once it's landed on Mars, we're talking about the science beginning. Um, this rover is gonna be doing some incredible work that's different than any of the rovers we've landed before. Right. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so even down to the drill, if you look at prior rovers, like the Curiosity rover, it has a drill that's meant to grind the, the soil and the dirt and the rocks into a fine powder. If you look at the drill for the Curiosity or for Perseverance, it's actually a coring drill, so it's meant to take more of an intact sample, about the size of a piece of chalk, for those of you old enough to ha know chalkboards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar with that. Right? <laughs> um, so the, even down to the drill, it's completely different. Um, we'll understand stratigraphy, so if you imagine like lines on the side of a rock, mm -hmm. th those lines tell you different information, and having those lines preserved gives you orders of more magnitude of more information about that geology than if you ground it all up and mix it together. Ah, so having it as a core, a yeah. solid core. How long is, is that? It's about 10 centimeters long. 10 centimeters, okay. And so what are the chances, we know that this is, uh, has been uh, called an astrobiology mission. Um, we, uh, we're gonna be looking for signs of life in these cores? Yeah, ancient, signs of ancient life. Ancient life. Yeah. Dinosaur bones. Di <laughs> Not dinosaur bones. Uh. <laughs> I Where remember that line from our launch coverage, which of which you were a, a co-host. You yes. said, "No, we're not going to be finding dinosaur bones." <laughs> Trying to make it a thing, though. No. Yeah, you, yeah, it's a we'll thing with it, me we'll at make least. It a thing, we'll yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think? I mean, the yeah. sign. What would be a sign of ancient life? Yeah. So they're looking for what we call biosignatures. There are um, ca carbon structures. There are things that, if you see this signature, you know that it came from, or it's very. Uh, that chances are high that it came from a biological source. Um, with the Allen Hill meteorite, right, there were, there were signatures there that people would argue back and forth whether or not it came from a biological source or naturally occurring, just regular process, geology-induced processes. So there are these biosignatures that really hint more strongly at the fact that it comes from something that was living. Now, the Allen Hill meteorite, this was something that struck Mars, yes. right, and pieces of Mars hit earth that's and, right and we know that we have parts of mars on on earth but they traveled through our atmosphere and exactly and, and was exposed to the environment of earth yeah um but that's interesting that there was such incredible debate yeah there was yeah and i love i think it was Lori glaze during our interview during the launch commentary that said someone said that it was all kind of inadvertent uh, random sample return i think oh, i think it was jennifer trosper sample return kind of at, at random, what something hit, hit Mars millions of years ago, maybe billions of years ago, and it launched out and it fell onto Earth. But now we can use instruments to selectively choose where we want our samples to be. And it's really incredible that we have the choice based on these in-situ instruments to pick the right place. And let's talk a little bit about that. The place you picked was Jezero Crater. Yeah. And a lot has, has been made about this. Uh, you know, it looks like it was a, a river delta yeah, that, river. that flowed into a lake. Yeah, so there, there's a lake and it has these river deltas, basically evidence that water was flowing in and flowing out of this, this lake area. 
So those deltas are really great at preserving uh, the, those sediments, those, those biosignatures, whatever might be there, possible biosignatures, right. um, in, into uh, a nice surface that we can core and interrogate. What do you think? Do you think there might be ancient life on Mars? I mean, the, with the numbers out there, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, could, could life exist somewhere else? Possibly. And the nice thing about being a scientist um, at heart, right, and, and a scientist by training, is that I don't have to, it doesn't matter what I think, let's see what the data says, right? Well, we, of course, have an in informed opinion, right? We have an informed uh, location that we're going to that will set us up for success, that if life does or ancient life does exist anywhere on Mars, that's a really great place to find it. And we're going to fly those samples back to Earth. First time anything like this has ever been done. That's right. Yeah. The, there has been no sample return from Mars in, ever. And any planet. Any Or any planet. That's right. Yeah. Well, and, and there's the moon, of course, uh, Apollo, right? They brought samples back. Other than that. That's it. Yeah. Um, there's also a really neat tech demonstration yeah. with the Mars helicopter. Yeah. And that that's getting a lot of buzz because people are like, how do you fly on Mars in such a super thin atmosphere? We know that here on Earth, you need an atmosphere, you need something for which to, to drive and propel you up, right? But that barely exists on Mars. It does, and that's why it was such a huge challenge, and, and I give so much kudos to the, the team that actually made this happen. Um, yeah, you don't have very much atmosphere, it's 1% of that of Earth, so you don't have a lot to, to give you lift. And so they had to make the propellers extremely light. There's a lot of foam in there. If you were to cut away the carbon fiber wrapping on the outside, it, it's mostly air in there. Mm. Um, but yet it's still structurally sound. It has to work. It has to spin without breaking apart into little pieces. <laughs> um, so yeah, they made light propellers. They made uh, the body, the fuselage, very light. Um, and then the propellers also spin at a very high rate. When you were here, what was that experience like watching a launch? Yeah, I've watched launches in the past, but none. I haven't seen the launch end to end of something that I've worked on. This was the first launch where I knew that I helped with that baby in there in that payload fairing. That that is, I've contributed to that, and to see it launch, it just meant so much more to me. And I didn't think that a launch would mean any more than it usually does. It's already spectacular, um, but yeah, it was just very very emotional. <laughs> You were a part of the launch broadcast. Did you yeah. describe what, what was going through your mind, what you were feeling as you were watching the rocket lift off? Yeah, it, it, there was a lot of com compartmentalization happening during the launch broadcast because you were there, you, you kind of had a job to do, uh, and I wanted to stay focused on the cause, but also you're, something exciting is happening that took seven years to, to get to this point. So yeah, it was a mix between professionalism and excitement and just, okay, keep it together. A lot of internal monologues happening. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. Dr. Mujigay Cooper, we appreciate you being here and visiting us here on the Rocket Ranch. And thanks for sharing your insight on the Mars 2020 project and the Perseverance rover. Yeah, go Perseverance. Good luck on the landing too. Thank you, yeah. A special thanks to Dr. Mujigay Cooper, NASA JPL's Planetary Protection Lead for Mars Perseverance. And to learn more about everything going on at the Kennedy Space Center, go to nasa.gov forward slash Kennedy. And if you'd like to find out what's happening at our other NASA centers around the country, go to nasa.gov forward slash podcast. A special shout out to our producer, John Sackman, and editor, Frankie Martin. And remember, on the Rocket Ranch, you gotta keep looking up. <laughs>